People ask me all the time, well, if XP is so good, if extreme programming is so good, then why isn't everybody using it? And the answer is it wasn't promoted. There is no major organization behind it. Ken Beck wrote a book. He's a brilliant man. And he wrote an amazing book, Extreme Programming Explained. And a lot of people on the order of thousands, not millions, implemented it by reading the book. And I, I've talked to many of these people and they have really have positive experiences. If you talk to any ex xp -er, anybody who did XP in the past, they have such a fondness for it and always want to go back to it. And whenever you encounter this consistently, it's a big flag, it's a, I would call it a green flag that says to us, hey, this, this is a methodology that can work. I've talked to hundreds of developers who've done this. I've helped thousands of developers do these practices. And so I've seen them work. And I know that the idea of emerging designs, rather than trying to think about the perfect design up front and then implementing it, can be highly efficient. But it's a series of skills, right? And you gotta practice them so that, so that they're second nature. And those are the things that take a little bit of upfront thinking about when you're a junior that come naturally to seniors. I think there's really two phases of software development. When you're a junior and trying to figure out how to make behavior happen in a computer. But once you figure that out, then the question is, how do you make behavior happen in a computer in a way that gives you flexibility in the future? And that actually is the more interesting question because that implies elegance in your design. That implies a true design rather than just a bunch of instructions to the computer. It implies organizing the process in a way that gives us maximum flexibility. And when we do that, it reveals a whole new science, the science of information, the science of how knowledge is organized, because we realize that information has a nature. And when we can start to study it, we can start to recognize how to bring out different qualities of information. I'm a big believer that Agile must exist in software. You know, that's, that's, if we're doing agile software development, our software has to be flexible. It has to be changeable. It has to be verifiable. And that requires certain practices to be able to do that. And those are the practices of extreme programming. Th this is no secret, guys. All this stuff is out there in the literature. It's just not popular because there's no certification body making millions of dollars on having you find out about it. There are technical practices that have been fundamentally ignored in the industry. But within the community of real agile software developers, I don't mean the, the marketers and the scrum people and all that. I mean the developers, the, the people who have been working in these areas for a long time. They have answers. I know I, I must be talking gibberish to some people because you know, you've been a software developer for many years and you've never heard anyone talk about this stuff. But this doesn't invalidate it. There's this, a lot of this stuff is still true. And it, it, these are the things that have helped me the most. So I'm excited to share them. One of my favorite quotes, I think it's from Winston Churchill, who said, planning is essential. Plans are worthless. And I believe that. It's good to think about and have plans, but it's also really important to be flexible and be able to change your plans midstream. And that's really what software agility is about. And in order to do it, it's not, it doesn't come from wishful thinking, guys. It doesn't come from better management processes, although that can help. It comes from writing flexible code. It comes from simple technical practices, like encapsulation of construction, encapsulation of as much as possible, like understanding and, and using design patterns, like defining acceptance criteria for the software that you built. Having the perspective of thinking in terms of what is this feature supposed to do? What is the end result? What is, how will I know that I'm done? Is, is the question that I like to ask. And that allows me to form the acceptance criteria that I want to create. That, understanding what the customer wants, thinking about that, that's a, the, the bulk of the upfront work that I do. And that's still quite important. But then how we actually implement that I take that as what I do in development, okay? So there's essentially two phases that mirror the two aspects of understanding of the requirements that we want to build, which are the what and the how. And we wanna separate those out, always separate them out, because this is the thing that gives us good encapsulation, not just encapsulation of data, but encapsulation of the concepts 
so that we truly get the leverage of hiding implementation details, giving us the freedom to change it later, right? These are the things that we want to think about when we're building a system so that we have flexibility to change those things later. This is how we build those things in by, by thinking about these issues. So what do we want to do? We want to think about the simplest thing. And then we want to think about how, when we get new requirements, can we allow those new requirements to uh, emerge from our existing system? This is where I think a lot of developers get it wrong because they think about that as an afterthought and then they just tack on new features. And a lot of times that degrades the overall quality. What we wanna do is when we get the new information, we wanna recognize that and refactor our code to accommodate the new features. 